Okay, so um, I've had a couple of people tell me that there's some things that they aren't quite entirely clear on in some of the topics. So when that happens, you can either stop me right away while I'm lecturing. I'm always glad to go back and review or describe something in a different way. Or um, send me an email, um, either via Canvas or the school email. And then what I'll do is I will read the questions off um, and answer them at the next lecture, OK? So what I'm planning to do at this point is we have, we're on chapter six, which is the last one that we're going to cover in this semester. And I'm going to just keep on plowing through it. That way, I'll have a little bit more time for review. I don't have a little bit of extra time than not enough time. So I'm just going to, I I have on the, um, this week on the schedule, it's, we're only going up through section eight, but I think I might be able to get through at least through um, section six today of that chapter. So I might go a little faster than I had, I had planned. We'll see how it goes. So let's talk about trees. And, um, Trees have a, have a lot to do with it. They're very similar to biological trees in the sense that they have a root, they have leaves, and they have branches. The only big difference between trees that you see outside the window and the trees that we're going to be dealing with here is that our trees are going to have the root at the top and grow downwards rather than upwards. And I think that's just because it makes it a lot easier to draw. So that's why they're doing it. And let's just get a look at some examples of trees. So um, this one is a classification tree for bi biology. And you'll notice here at the root is the animalia, all sorts of animals. And you have the ones with spinal cords and the arthropods. And then within each of it, you've got the, essentially you've got the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And these go descend from the root. That's one thing that I'm, they don't, I don't think they say this specifically in the book, but trees are directed. They have a direction and these arrows tell where things go. And I'm going to go into the terminology after I show you these examples here. But you've probably all seen things like this in your biology textbooks. Uh, another example of trees is the directory structure for Unix and the directory structure for the Windows system would have the drive name at the root, which would be C colon. It turns out that on Unix and this, by the way, I'm going to have to remake this diagram. This is not exactly accurate. The root of the file system in Unix is does not have a name at all. The slash is really a separator that separates levels of directories. So the root is unnamed. It is the, the directory that cannot be named is the root directory. And so underneath that, we have our top level, which is a dev, Etsy, Sbin, all of these. And then under each one of them, they have subdirectories. So you can see this as a tree structure. And now, you have probably seen it already, by the way. You're, let's see if I can come here. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so for example, here I have um, this, and there's a subdirectory. Let me find something that has a lot of subdirectories in it. Here we go. So for computer science, in there are the assignments, in there is abstract, algorithm analysis. And so this is a tree that's on its side. So you've seen trees all along. You just haven't called them that because they haven't been vertically oriented. They've been horizontally oriented. And do I have any subdirectories in any of these? Probably not. No. So that's a tree. And again, to go with the way that we're familiar with seeing it, Uh, in, in, in computer science trees, we're going to have it vertically now instead of horizontally. Is everybody okay with that? And let's see if they have another example. Yes. 
when I have something called HTML, how many of you all have ever written web pages? Have you ever seen, have you ever seen this sort of thing on a web page before? Okay, a little quick explanation. These things in angle brackets are called tags. And a tag is sort of like a verb that tells you what, what a, if they contain things. So HTML is the top level container and every opening tag ideally will have a closing tag. Inside the HTML document, I have the head, which contains the title that you see in the title bar and meta information, like what character set is this um, written in? And they're missing a, a double quote here. I'm going to have to fix that later on. This happens to be a closing and opening tag all wrapped into one. So I've got the head and then the body, sort of like a letter that you write to somebody has the head that has the address and the date, and then the body is what you want to tell them. So inside the body, I have a level one header that says a simple web page. Oops, sorry about that. Let's go back to here. That's what H1 stands for. UL is an unordered list. Those are the bulleted lists. And inside each bulleted list are list items. So these tags tell what you are doing. And inside the beginning and ending tag is the content that you want to have displayed. So now you know everything there is to know about HTML. And I'm not almost not kidding when I say that, because that is pretty much all there is to HTML. And we can take this structure here. Notice the indenting, by the way, is helping us a lot to see what's going on, and we can draw it as a tree. So HTML is at the head, which contains a head and body. The head contains the meta and title elements, and the body will contain a unordered list, which contains list items. So we can draw it that way. And in fact, there's something called the document object model. If you get into JavaScript, where you can manipulate this tree and put things in and dynamically change what the page looks like and the content on the page, by changing the tree. It's very, very neat to be able to do this. Now, some terminology. And there are arrowheads here, but the arrows are not very big. I'm going to have to remake this diagram later on. I'll probably do that sometime before I upload everything here. Okay, and these are these the terms that you need to know about when we're talking about trees. Okay. A node is one of these guys here, the squares. And a node contains a key, which is the name of the node. So nodes are done by name. So the name of this node is A. The name of this node is node C. And in the book, they call it a key. And sometimes you'll have a value associated with it. Sort of like a hash map has keys and values. An edge is the arrow. And there is an arrowhead. You've got to believe me on this. Um, that goes from the a node to another node that's an edge so all your nodes are going to be connected by edges except for the root node yeah. um the root node does not have any edges coming into it and there's the root up at the top a path is simply a series of edges that will get you to a destination starting at a particular point so the path from A to D is through B, A following the edge from A to B, following the edge from node B to node D, that's the path. And it's a, it's a list connected by edges. Um, children are the descendants, the things that are below a particular node. So G is the child of C. D, E, and F are the children of B. B and C are children of A, direct children. And the parent is the one that they are children of. So D, E, and F have a parent B. B has a parent A. Um, all nodes have parents except for the root node. The root node is the one that has no parent because there's nothing above it. Siblings are those nodes that have the same parent. So D, E, and F are all considered to be siblings. Question, are H and I sibling nodes or not? How many people think they are? How many people think they aren't? Okay. And how many people don't care? Okay. 
So yes, H and I are not siblings because they do not have the same parent. By the way, somebody was asking, um, last time I was in a data structures course, somebody said, why don't you use a family tree as an example? The answer is family trees do not, rep do not follow the rules for a computer science tree. And I'll get to those on the next couple of slides. Uh, subtree, if we were to cover up A, C, and G, if we were to get rid of them, we'd have this thing here, B, D, E, F, H, and I. But you notice that looks like a tree, doesn't it? So that's a subtree. So A has a left subtree, which is B, and has a tree C and G. That's a tree, even though it's not a very fancy one, it's still a tree. It has a root of C and it has a child G, and there's an edge between them. Um, a leaf node is a node that has no descendants. So what are the, um, first of all, how many leaf nodes are there in this tree and which ones are they? Three and they are? Right, H, I, and G are the leaf nodes because they have no descendants. Um, the level tells how far down the tree you are. The root is defined to be at level Z, oops, at level zero. B and C are at level one. D, E, F, and G are at level two. H and I are at level zero, one, two, three. Yes, thank you. And the height of the tree is the maximum um, level. So the height of this tree is three. Yeah. Pardon? On this one, there are three leaves. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. There is one. Yeah, E is a leaf. I forgot that one. You're right. That, that was hiding there in the middle. Very good. Okay, so that we have four leaves. I, I, am, I stand corrected. H, E, I, and G are the leaves. And I just you tend to see these as all belonging together. And I forgot that this, this one does not have a descendant. So you're right. Good catch. Okay, there's two ways to define a tree. Here's one of them. You des designate one node as the root. Every node is connected by exactly one edge from its parent node. And if I want to get from the root to a node, there's a unique path. There are, you can't have two different ways to get there. And that's, by the way, why, why a family tree is not this um, a computer science tree. Because in a family tree, there's... Depending on how badly people are intermarried, and I, I don't want to go too too deep on that subject, um, there can be more than one way to get from the root of the tree to one of the family members. So that's one. This is almost an iterative definition of a tree. There's another definition of a tree, which I like a little bit better, and it's a recursive definition. Namely, a tree is either empty or it has a root with, and this should be zero or more subtrees, by the way. So let me fix that right now. With zero or more subtrees, each of which is also a tree. And each subtree is connected to the root by an edge. Um, so I know that this tree has at least four nodes. Again. Yeah. Um, no, I'm sorry. Yes, because I have a subtree. Yeah. Uh, could the subtree have be empty? Yeah, it could. So I know I have at least one. If there's a node in each of these subtrees, there are at least four nodes, but I'd have to look at each subtree to find out what it is, what's in it. And notice the recursion here. A tree has a subtree, which is also a tree. And if we look at it here, that was the diagram. I have this root, and here's the one subtree, and here's another subtree. And this subtree, let's concentrate on it one. It has its root with another subtree. And this subtree consists only, the one that's um, highlighted in green, has only a root and no subtrees on it. That's the one with zero subtrees. But this allows us to define a tree in terms of itself as a recursive definition. And a lot of the stuff that we're going to do with trees 
it's going to be much more elegant to write a solution that uses recursion to go around and evaluate things in a tree than having to do it with for loops and while loops, which gets really ugly. So that gets us through vocabulary and definition. Now, the question is, what things do we have to be able to do with a tree? Well, we have to be able, okay, well, one definition here that almost forgot to say here is, if each node in the tree has a maximum of two children, then we have a binary tree. So this one here is not a binary tree because this node has three children. Um, I don't think I have any examples here. This one happens to, we got lucky on this one. This one is a binary tree because each node has no more. Nope, this one has three descendants. Damn. Well, I just can't cut a, catch a break today, can I? When we get to um, a parse tree for arithmetic expressions, which is a little bit later in the chapter, you'll see a true binary tree. And that's what we're going to be concentrating on in this entire chapter. So we're going to be calling them binary trees. We need to be able to get the root value and store the root, set the root value. And this has to be changed to say value. Let me write this down here. We want to be able to get the binary tree that's on the left. So that's the left child, which will again be a tree. Because remember, that's what this diagram here tells us. And we need to be able to get the right child. We need to be able to insert a binary tree and install it as the left child of a node. And we need to be able to insert a new tree as the right child of the current node so that we can grow the tree. And there's two different ways to um, store these internally. And I have to rephrase that last sentence, unfortunately, because that's uh, what I was doing is I had changed Python to Java. And yeah, Python gives you two ways of doing it. But Java, there's really only one way that will work efficiently. So I have to change um, two very to one very. But I'm going to show you them both anyway. Name of the first one is a list of lists. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this tree and it's going to have A and then B and C are its, dis let, let, let's just go with the subtrees first. What is the sub left subtree of A? Well, that's the one that has B as its root. And then that has two subtrees itself, the D and E. That's its left and right. So D has an empty left subtree and an empty right subtree. And then E is a empty, has an empty, empty children on its left and right. But they are both part of this list here, which tells the tree for B. Similarly, C on the right has a left subtree, which is F that doesn't go nowhere but it has no right subtree. And we use an empty list to stand for no, no subtree. So that's a list. So I have the left half becomes a list, the right half becomes a list, and that goes into the big list. And again, the structure is recursive. And this will work really well when we have something called dynamic typing. Uh, because in Python, when you have a list, they don't all have to be the same type. Remember in Java, you have to have the same type for an array list. All of the elements have to be either double or integer or whatever. Yeah, not in Python. 
that means that I can have a list that looks like this has an integer, a string, a double, a Boolean, and another list. And Python can handle all that wonderfully well. Java, unfortunately, does not handle this tremendously well. Because again, we have to know what the static type is. We have to have our types established beforehand. Um, there are languages that are statically typed where you'd have to define the type of everything, but you can still pull a trick like this by doing something called a union type that specifies that a variable can have many different types. Um, but again, Java doesn't let us do this. Okay. That's in the large. In the small, we could work around that by making it an array list of objects and then use instance of to figure out what kind of object we have. This would get really ugly really fast. I'm almost tempted to make that an extra exercise if anybody wants to try and implement that. I'd give them the Python code and say, try and do this with an array list of object. But believe me, it's... It's going to be ugly. It's going to be just horrible. So no, let's not do that. So we're going to say, no, I'm sorry, but we're not. A list of lists, while it's really clever, it's a nice, compact way of doing it. It's recursive. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're in love with it. Sorry, we're not going to be able to do it with Java. That's too bad. Um, other way to do it is with nodes and references. So what we're going to have is a class with attributes for the root, as well as the left and right subtrees. And this works well with our object-oriented stuff. So here in a binary tree, let's go and look at this real quick. Uh, Binary.java. A tree has a key, and I'm using generics here so that we can have trees of strings, trees of integers, trees of whatever the heck we want. And it has a left child, which is also a tree, and a right child, which is, again, another tree. So now we have a recursive data definition. It's not a recursive method, but we have a data that's defined in terms of itself. But it's all going to work out fine because we're going to have a base case, and that's going to be when we hit null. When we get null for the left child or right child, we know that we don't have to go any further. There are no children. It's like that empty list was in Python. And now the question is, how do we insert something at the left? If there is no left child, then we set it. And zippo bang, we're done. What if there is already a left child? Then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to create a new tree with our new node. And then we're going to say the left child of the current node becomes the left child of our new one. Wow, I've, I've got to draw a picture of this, okay? Because I'm reading the code and I see what it says, but that probably doesn't give me much of a clue of what's really happening. Does this give you any idea of what the hell is going on? No, 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 not even remotely. Okay. So let's think here. Oh, here comes the fun part. Let's stop the sharing for the moment. And let's turn on the video. I guess it would help if I unblocked the lens. Okay. So here we have A. I'm just drawing. This is a binary tree. Everything's happy. Now, let's say this is our node here, and we want to insert something at the left. Let's go back. I'm going to go back here and look at this real quick so I can see what's happening. Um, okay. So. Yeah. Got it. 
Okay. So let's say I want to put an F in as a left child here. I'm going to create a new node called F. Now what I'm going to say is the left of F is going to be here. It's going to, whatever A had as its left child, that's going to become the left child of my new node. And then here, I'm going to set the left child of the node where I want to insert it. And now I have my tree all set up. I took the new node became the left child of the one where I wanted to insert it. So it's sort of pushing everything down. Do you need me to go over that again? And this F, by the way, does not have a right node. Inserting a right child is similar. So let's say I want to insert a G here on the right of B. So here's my current node. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new node called G. And then I'm going to say G's right node. Okay, let me look at the thing here. The right node of G will become the right node of so G, which moves D over to here. And that means that B is going to now refer to G. So now G is on the right, and there's nothing on the left of G. So that's how we insert things into a binary tree. But again, I have to draw a picture of it so to convince myself that this actually works. Okay, let's go back to sharing the screen. So I'm, I'm glad I did that because I've, uh, I, I wasn't entirely convinced there. And then getting and setting the root value um, for a tree, that's the key. And then getting the left child and getting the right child. So that that part's not very tricky. It's the inserting new nodes. It's the tricky part. And if there's all no left child or no right child, then pop it right in where, where it belongs. So if I wanted to put a new left child on G, I'd just create the node and boom, it would be there. Uh, do I need to show that? Yeah, I guess I do. So if I wanted to put a left child of G, if this were now my current node, I would say, oh, is there a left child? No, great. Create a new node called H, and that's the left child of G. We're done. So the, oh, the tricky part comes where there's when there's already, and this is where we're going to see this pattern over and over again. If there's already a left child or a right child, then we have to do all sorts of weird stuff. If there is no left child or no right child, things are a lot easier. I can make some comment about it's easier not having children, but that's that's a that's a totally different topic. Okay. So that's what we're going to be doing with, with this constructor here. Um, now, there's two things that we haven't talked about. And one of them is, yeah, we can construct this tree. But how do we show it? How do we you know, see what the contents are? And I'm going to have to leave that for a later topic. And the other um, question is, well, fine, but what can I do with this sort of thing? Um, do I have this file here? Yeah. So let's take a look at this real quick. So here I'm going to create a new binary tree where A is at the root. And just to see that it works, I'm going to see what the root value is. It should come back with A. And I should get a null because there is no left or right child. Then I'm going to insert B as a left child. And when I get this, I should get a reference to the binary tree that I've inserted. And if I want the root value of the left child, I should get a B. I'm going to 
insert a C at the right and check to see that it actually got there okay. And then I'm going to say, um, set the right child's root value to D. So I'm gonna change it from a C to a D. So all of this is just to see that these things are actually doing what I want. Yeah. And we're getting the right things. Yeah. I know that's not terribly satisfying. Okay, but at the moment, that's about the best we can do. By the way, yes, this is going a lot faster than I thought. Before I go too much further, though, let's just stop for a second. And if there are any things that are burning questions right now or things that are you're totally confused on, now would be a good time to clear them up before I get any deeper into this. Okay. Hearing no, if you have any questions that I haven't answered and you want to ask anonymously, send me an email. So now, what are we? What the, what the hell good is this? Okay, if, you know, yeah, direct restructures, you know, whoop de doo. Okay, um, and you know, knowing that, you know, cats are core date animals. You know, wow, terrific. Okay, but let's let's, let's do something computer sciencey and useful. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be parsing an arithmetic expression. Now, we already did that with stacks, remember? But now what we're going to do is we're going to build a tree out of these arithmetic expression, and then we're going to go through the tree in order to evaluate it. And in fact, I may as well give you some nice little terminology, something called AST. Now, that also means Associates in Science Transfer, which is the new degree that we have in computer science, but that's not what we're talking about here. And something called an abstract syntax tree. And what this does is as you are parsing a program, you create a tree of all the loops and the all the constructs that are in your syntax. Once you have that tree, you can now use tree manipulation techniques. For example, there's something called tree shaking. You know how you shake a tree to get rid of the dead leaves? Okay, you can do something similar now that you have a tree of the program to get rid of code that is inaccessible or unused. So it eliminates dead code. So you can manipulate the abstract syntax tree and say, okay, what optimizations can I make? And then you take that and use that to compile your code. So compilers do a lot of this stuff with the abstract syntax tree. And this is sort of the thing that this is, that's a supercharged version of what we're going to be doing here. So for example, if I have seven plus three times five minus two, this is the abstract syntax tree that I would, or the parse tree that I would have. My root would be multiply. The left subtree is the addition part, which is seven and three are its leaves. And the minus is the right subtree, that's the right half of the expression, and its operands are five and two. So in this case, I'm going to have a tree where the root is an operator and the leaves are going to be operands. Are you sharing anything, David? Um, I should be sharing my screen here. Hold on, let me, let me share the screen again. Sure. Is that better? Yes, now I see it. Thank you. Okay, because it said here, you are sharing and stop share before, but apparently it didn't take. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, well, let me go back over here. This is the parse tree for a sentence where a sentence consists of a noun phrase and verb phrase and so on. Um, and here it is for this expression. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an expression like this that's fully parenthesized. Yeah, question? Okay. And then I'm going to create a tree. And then I'm going to go through the tree in some magical method that will allow me to evaluate the expression. So that that's the, that's the plan for this. And what's going to happen is I'm going to simplify the plus the 7 and 3, which will give me a 10. 
and I'll simplify the minus the five and two, which will give me a three. And then I re-simplify that and that gives me a 30. Uh, no, I was, yeah, that, that does give me a 30. That's correct. Yeah, 10 times three is 30. That's right. So what we're gonna have to do is build a parse tree, evaluate the expression, and also recover the original expression. So if you give me a parse tree, I wanna be able to show you where it came from. And so what we do is we're going to build, break the expression up into a list of tokens. And the tokens we have are left parentheses, right parentheses, the operators, and the operands. So whenever I have a left parenthesis, I know I have a new expression. That means I have to open up a new subtree. Whenever I read a right parenthesis, I finish an expression, and that means I can go up one level in my tree. And also we know that every operator is going to have a left and right child. Now, this is a very oversimplified thing, which means we can't do things like unary plus and unary minus. So we can't do something like um, three plus negative five. <laughs> so our parse tree isn't going to be sophisticated enough to handle that. Oh, well. That, that's why compiler writing is a lot trickier than it looks like at first. Yeah. And here are our rules. If we have a parenthesis, we're going to add a new node as the left child of the current node and descend to it. Uh, if the current token is in the list of operators, that becomes the root of the current node. And we're going to have to have a new node as the right child because we're going to be following that operator with the second operand. If we have a number, that's going to be the root value of our current node. And then we're going to go back to the parent. If we have a parenthesis, that means we're done with the sub-expression. We go back to the parent of the current node. I've written down these rules here so I know what's going on. And this shows it. Do you want me to do it on the board here and show it to you step by step or go through these this thing here? Step by step would be better. OK, um, let's try this here. Stop sharing. Turn the video on again. OK, this is going to be exciting. Uh, since you all have your computers at home, you can look at look at the rules as I'm going along. OK, so what do we have here? We had 7 plus 3 times 5 minus 2. And that whole thing was parenthesized, correct? Okay, so we have a right, a left parenthesis. That means we have to add a new node. So otherwise, we're going to start with an empty list. We start a new node and put something here at the left. And you know what? I'm going to let me find this here. And we're going to descend to that node. I'm going to check something here to make sure I'm, do, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. Oh, they're doing a different example than I'm doing. Well, let's, let's just follow this along and see what happens, shall we? Couldn't hurt. Um, okay. Now we have another parenthesis here. Were there two parentheses, by the way, in the book? This one? Okay, so now, hmm? yeah, okay, great. So that means we're getting this second parenthesis here. And we're going to open up another left one. And this is where we, now, the next thing that comes up is a number. So we're going to set the root of that to the value and then return to the parent. 
that handled the seven. Now we have an operator. The operator says, set the root node of the current to be the operator. That means the plus goes in here. And we're going to add a node to the right. Oops, wrong color. Add a node to the right. And that becomes our current node. Okay, we've handled the plus, now we move on to the threes. That's a number, and that means it goes in here. And we go to the parent node. So this is the node that we're going to currently look at. Now we have a right parenthesis. That's the next thing that has. And if it's a right parenthesis, then we go up to the parent node. So that's now our current node. Next thing is our multiplication. That's an operator. We put the operator in there. I'm going to use a star there. And so it's not a, so it's more visible than a dot. So far, so good. I'm just following the rules here quite mechanically. I'm not even thinking about what's what has to happen. I'm, these are the rules. I'm following them. And we're going to open up a new node to the right and descend to it. That becomes our node. We've just handled this. OK, great. Now we have a left parenthesis, which means we have let me move this a little bit over here. So I have more room. Okay. We're going to open up a node to the left and descend to it. Next thing to look at is the five. That's a number. It goes in there, and we move back to the parent. Now we have a minus sign. Minus sign goes in there. We open up a right node because we're going to need the other operand. And that becomes the next node that we're going to be looking at. We have our two here. And the two um, is a number. We put the number in and return to our parent. We have a closing parenthesis, which says, uh, return to the parent. And here, since we're at the end, we have nothing to do. We're up at the root. And there's the parse tree for that. And that should look like what was in the book. Does it? OK. So wow, this is amazing. This works. This is a little bit trickier than the one they give in the book as an example, but I'm glad we did this. So now that we know that these rules work, we can all be very happy about that. Uh, let me stop the video. Let me start sharing again here. If you aren't seeing it, let me know and I'll try it again. It's Are you good. It okay? Yes, it's good. Okay, wonderful. And so what we're going to do here is look at the code for that. May as well go straight to the code. And here's parse tree builder. So what we will do is we're going to split into tokens by splitting on blank. Um, which means, by the way, that when we have the example that we're going to be doing here, we're going to have to put a blank after every single thing in there, which is sort of ugly, but oh well. And I'm sure there's a way to do it more conveniently, but I, as long as we have single digit numbers, I could make it work without the blanks. But try to leave it as it is for right now. Again, that's why that's why writing a compiler is not as easy as these examples. And what we're going to do is now. We're also going to need a stack. Remember how it says return to the parent? Okay, well, how do we know where the parent is? Okay, and the answer is every time we go down one level, we'll push the parent onto a stack. Then when it says, okay, return to the parent, we just pop the stack and boom, we're there. Stacks are also pretty good. So that's why we have this thing called the parent stack. 
Because it's very easy for me to just casually, oh yeah, return to the parent node. Well, great. How, how do I do that? Don't I have to keep track of that? Yeah, you do. Okay? And a stack is a perfect place to keep track of this. So I'm going to create a new tree with an empty node. And then I will say, okay, this is the parent that I was where this is the parent I was looking for. And then I have my current tree, and that's going to be at the root. Then I go through and I follow my rules. If I have an open parenthesis, I'm going to create a new left node and remember the, where its parent was and then move down to that child. Um, you know, let's do this. So my current tree is always the the node that I'm I, the, the subtree that I'm currently working on. Finally, if I have one of my operators here, I'm going to set the token. I'm going to insert a new write node. Remember who its parent was, and then descend to it. I'm going. To, I'm not going to put this comments in on this one again. It's, it's the same thing, only right versus left. If I have a number for my token, I set that and then I move back to my parent. How do I do that? I pop the parent stack and there I'll be. And that becomes the current tree that I'm working with. And if I have a closing parenthesis, I move back and to the, to the parent. So those are the rules that were written in the book. I'm just putting them in code now. And then if I get something that's not a plus minus times divide or parentheses, then I'm going to say it's an unknown token. And I crash the program. And then I return the expression tree. So what you're going to get back is the the tree that got built by all these rules. Now, what's this business about is number? How can I tell if a token is a number? Well, since these are happen to be all single digits, oh no, they don't have to be because I'm using spaces. So I could have several digits, right? I could have as many numbers as I want because that would be a token. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to do value of, we're going to try and convert this string into an integer. And if it succeeds, then it's a number. If it failed, it'll will catch the exception and will return false. This is what's called a utility routine. It's something I'm using to make my life a little bit easier. It's a lot easier for me to say is number than having to put all this code here in the middle of this if else chain. Um, technically, I guess it would be nice to say, make this a private static Boolean because nobody else needs to call that. We don't want our main calling is a number. Who cares? Main doesn't care. So it probably be a slightly better. Um, and that is, let's see if it still compiles. Okay, it still compiles. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. So now, the, great. Now we have a code that will build a tree. Now the question is, once we have the tree built, how do we evaluate the expression? And it looks like I am at the end of lecture time, so we're going to have to wait on Wednesday for that. Yeah, cliffhanger. Well, of course, you know, this does not stop you from reading the book and finding out for yourself, of course. That's true. And the stuff that I'm going to upload, it turns out it has, I'm going to, up, since, I, since I didn't know how far I was going to get, this parse tree example here, nah will um, do all of that. And it will also um, change the parse tree into a string. So all that code will go over on Wednesday, starting on Wednesday. And then I'll move forwards from there. And where will that put us? That will put us on tree traversals. Excellent. Yeah, this is great. So we'll do the rest of this on tree traversals. 6.9, I will not go into detail on. 
um, and 6.10 and 6.11. I'm going to talk about what priority cues are, but I think I'm going to skip over that. I might come back and pick it up if we have a lot of time left over. So read 6.8, definitely. That's You're definitely going to need that. Read 6.9 so you can see what a priority cue is. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, continue on with 6.12, which is binary search trees. So this is the stuff that's going to be a little bit, it has much deeper philosophical meaning. I've always wanted to say that. And AVL trees is 6.16, and we're probably going to get to that part next week. So that's it for today, I guess, uh, unless you've got any questions out there in Zoom land. No, I'm good. Okay. Um, I will stop recording then.